Fanalytics with Mike Lewis. Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Fanalytics podcast, online home, www.fandomanalytics. Uh, we are brought to you by the Emory Marketing Analytics Center, and you've got Mike Lewis and Doug Battle. Doug, how you doing? The Georgia Bulldogs are 2-0, and and I, I don't know, I, I didn't even look. Are they the number one ranked team? Probably not. They are. They are the number one ranked team oh. in the country. I think Alabama dropped to two after winning on the road, and Texas jumped into the top 25 after losing to Alabama. The Alabama effect, everyone. Georgia's yeah. now the number one team. It's kind of amazing. I think Georgia's becoming Alabama because the fan base was just constantly angry and upset about every little thing on Saturday as they beat down Sanford 33 to zero, but the offense didn't play well enough and defense wasn't disciplined. And I was like, man, you guys are turning into Alabama fans. This is what they've been doing for years, but they're the number one team with a very frustrated fan base over the performance against Sanford. (laughs) Um, I'm just enjoying it. You know, I'm enjoying college football in the same way that that LSU dude that just took a stroll onto the field this week is enjoying college football. He's one of the candidates for my super fan of the week, the Fanalytics super fan of the week. I'm going to tweet out a couple of those options and let the, let the people vote. But we had him, we had the Georgia fan. I like it. Yeah. We had the Georgia fan with the, but there's just was too many great fans this week. Georgia fan with a bone in his mouth. Um, Tennessee bride who revealed to her husband, her wedding dress, which was the checkered, Tennessee overalls on her wedding day. Um, An Auburn frat full of pledges that made a giant snake out of popcorn uh, boxes. I don't know how to say it. Buckets. And they had to hold them. The entire stadium was about, I don't know, maybe 40 feet long. And then the San Jose State fan and the Duckhead, the App State student body storming the street because they couldn't storm the field. And then the Texas fan chugging beer out of a wet or sweaty tennis shoe on college game day. College football fans are something different. Like I tried to find an NFL fan that the matched this level of insanity and you're, you don't get the same level of insanity anywhere else, but college sports. I think that's part of the appeal for people who, who really love college football or college basketball. The the kid at LSU was really striking. I mean, that was, that was some amazing. Was it a kid or was it a grown man? Um, I'm 55 years old, so if you're 30 years <laughs> I mean, the way he walked out there with, you know, at first it seemed like just like he belonged, right? right. And then, you know, as, as the walk went on, it seemed like, oh, this guy is, this guy's been sampling something that's probably not legal. And then the way the cops just threw a beat down on him was, uh, it was kind of was kind of brutal. Has there been any follow up on his story, or would that just sort of? I don't know away? If, if he has a concussion. He might be out for next week, Mike. He might be out for next week's game. We might not see him on the field. But I did love. I think he was just walking evidence of the fact that you can, if you pretend to know, or you pretend as if you're supposed to be somewhere. And people just accept it. I mean, he walked on that field like he was the head coach. Even if the head coach walked on the field, people would be like, wait a second, this guy can't do that. And he was out there for 10 seconds before. And, and the cops kind of walked up like, hey, is this guy, is he supposed to be here? I don't really know. <laughs> Obviously, he wasn't. And I liked that he kind of pled his case. He was like, hey, stop. You can't grab me, cop. Like, I'm, you know, I'm a fan. You can't do that. And then got taken down. Beatdown style. He didn't get KO'd in the same way that Adrian Peterson did by Le'Veon Bell, which I c- was completely unaware that they were fighting this weekend until I saw the video. Yeah, that seems to. I mean, you're too young to remember it, but you know there was a. I think it was an MTV bit called Celebrity Death Match that started out one of these claymation series, and that actually I think morphed into a. And I could be getting some of the order wrong. That morphed into a Fox you know, prime time event where they would put celebrities into a boxing ring against each other. I, I remember, I, I, I think they had, you know, like Horshack versus Screech from Save by Horshack from Welcome Back Cotter versus Screech from Save by the Bell. I think they had a couple of gymnasts fighting at some point. You know, I mean, it's like everything goes in, everything goes in cycles, but that, uh, the Levy and Bell, Adrian Peterson fight, 
you know, Doug, I, I don't know about you. It's like, I, I see these things now and now I just go straight to Twitter. And I don't even know why I go to Twitter because I can predict the comments in the back and forth almost always. Adrian T- Peterson taking a complete beating on Twitter. Fans commenting on the dozens in attendance. I couldn't tell how many people were watching. But it seems, you know, it, it was a fun little moment of, what would you call that kind of boxing? Sort of, I mean, it's like... boxing, I don't- it's still going on, though, right? Where when, we have, at what point is, does Le'Veon Bell advance to fighting Jake Paul now? Is it Jake uh, Paul versus Le'Veon Bell? When does I that happen? Has it Jake, already happened? Does Jake Paul want anything to do with a guy that looks like Le'Veon Bell? <laughs> hey, I, that's a fight. I That's a celebrity <laughs> fight. That would at least be somewhat interesting to me. I think even Le'Veon Bell versus AP, I kind of like two pros at the same position and the same field of play going at it in the ring. I mean, those are two guys that definitely you when they were playing football, you're, you're probably saying, man, imagine if this guy was a boxer. He'd probably be the best in the world. And so putting those guys in the ring is actually kind of interesting to me. I'd like to see Le'Veon Bell versus Jake Paul personally. Well, look, I mean, you know, we've got Jake Paul versus Anderson Silva, I think. Right. I want to say October 28th. Uh, you know, and again, it's like all these things. How long does this stuff play out? I mean, I, I don't... Does anyone... Is anyone taking this stuff seriously? Does anyone think that these are legitimate fights? At the, I mean, there, there was a knockout, right, of... Uh, what was it? Woodley by... Oh, I don't know why we're, we're engaging in so much of this kind of novelty boxing talk. Hey, I was just touching on it. I was just touching on it. My main concern... This week has been football. It's uh, We talked last week about how it's the most wonderful time of the year. Um, now it really is because not only do we have college football, we also have the NFL. And I'll start with college football. College football, part of the beauty of it is that nobody's really that good. Sometimes it feels like Alabama or Georgia or these, you know, oh, they could play in the NFL. This week was a reminder. Um, I don't know if I've seen so many missed field goals in my life across, particularly in the BYU Baylor game, both of which were ranked teams. And it came down to who will miss less field goals. Alabama looked terrible against Texas. Texas was rowdy and awesome. Apparently they didn't have air conditioning in the Alabama locker room, which was a malfunction. Um, I'm doing air quotes. (laughs) Um, College football just has this level of unpredictability and, uh, Lots of upsets. It felt like March Madness once again. Marshall at Notre Dame, App State at a and uh, A couple classics, Tennessee and Pitt, Kentucky, Florida, and of course, Alabama, Texas. So uh, football fans are getting everything they want. I, I feel like at this point on the national level, that's just a warm-up for Sunday. And Sunday is really the big dance with the NFL, Mike. And we've talked a lot about the NFL this offseason. I know you're excited. And I was excited to see a first week of Mike's predictions, Mike versus the media, getting off to a good start with those Cleveland Browns, getting that first win in spite of my criticism of Mike refusing to change his pick with Deshaun Watson out. Well, and again, maybe we should go through this sort of more systematically. We start with the college <laughs> pros. But yeah. look, I, I will say this, that, you know, the the very start of the NFL season, like we're in week, you know, we, 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 we're not even done with week one as we tape this on a Monday afternoon. A lot has already gone wrong in terms of the predictions, right? And so, look, the first thing that went down was the, the NFL suspended Deshaun Watson for 11 mm-hmm. games, kind of blowing up my Cleveland forecast or, or let's say blowing up the logic of the Cleveland forecast. But, you know, what happened after that? Well, Jimmy G did not get traded, Mm -hmm. which essentially kind of throws a wrench into the 49ers forecast. And then last night, we we see what the NFL is really known for, and that's Dak Prescott getting (laughs) getting hit multiple times in the hand and being out for, I think they said six, the estimate is six to eight weeks. So, you know, these things crumble, these things crumble quickly. I didn't... um, I actually put the numbers into the, you know, I, I actually updated the spreadsheet. I'm not going to share any of the numbers for my performance versus ESPN and the NFL.com simply because we're one game in, right? And we, we've got to, we've got to let this, uh, we got to get two, three games for anything, for any patterns to start to emerge on this kind of well, stuff. Well, of course. Yeah. The win percentage yeah. is going to be 100 or zero for anyone right now. So. <laughs> But it is, it is fun to see how quickly, and again, this is the beauty of the NFL in some ways. It's like, I think fans forget 
year to year, how much variation occurs, right? How many of the favorites crumble and how many of the, the teams come from nowhere and, and do something? Okay, so Doug, I'll give you a choice. You want to talk? And I, you know, we tend to focus on, let's say, you know, we got we got an hour. We don't have eight hours, so we focus on the the narratives and the the key, the key storylines and all this. You want to start college or you want to start NFL? Let's start NFL, Mike. I know I'm kind of biased to college as a Georgia guy, my team being number one right now, but I think NFL is the biggest story in sports right now. It was interesting yesterday seeing so many tweets that football is back, and for college fans, it's like, yeah, football's been back. But on a national scale, the NFL is the storyline. It is the one league that everyone seems to follow to some degree, maybe because of fantasy football um, being such a part of work culture and social culture in America. But nevertheless, the NFL has all kinds of storylines. Week one was phenomenal, did not disappoint so far. And we still got Monday night football coming up. So let's let's talk some NFL. Well, and again, and, and I don't have, even have a particular order. I mean, we, we started off with Josh Allen firmly cementing himself as, you know, as the weekend transpired, it was like, I think Josh Allen was the, and again, the media, I think, tends to be overreactive. Josh Allen starts out as the MVP choice for the league. And then by the end of the weekend, uh, they're, they're talking Kirk Cousins, right? I mean, it, but, but Josh Allen came out and I, I think delivered, and Buffalo came out and delivered a message of being, a very legit team. Um, I don't. I don't think anyone's doubting Buffalo. And again, the overreaction after one game. But Josh Allen is one of the. He was one of the top stories going in, and he's one of the top stories coming out of Week One. Josh Allen is my fantasy quarterback in one week, and I don't even think his stat line was great, and he helped me get a Week One victory. But I don't think that the stats even tell the story with Josh Allen. If you watch that game. Uh, I know one of the interceptions he threw was right in the hands of the receiver, and the receiver practically gave it to the defender. Might as well have been a fumble. Um, Josh Allen in that Bills offense, without Brian Dable, by the way, who's who's now the head coach of the Giants, so I think there was a little bit of question as to how much of their offensive success has been because of the offensive coordinator. We saw very quickly that with Josh Allen at the helm, uh, their coaching staff they have intact, they're going to be very successful going up against what's supposed to be one of the best teams in the NFL and the Rams coming off a of Super Bowl. And I, it made me think, Mike, it made me think about last year and that AFC championship game between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills. Shootout pretty much came down to a coin flip. First team that scores a touchdown wins. Chiefs win the toss. They drive down the field, score a touchdown straight to the Super Bowl. They're playing the Rams. Last night, we may have seen what would have happened between the Rams and the Bills had Buffalo made it. So I think Buffalo's been a lot of people's Super Bowl favorites this year. I think it's for good reason. I think their defense is nothing short of excellent. And Josh Allen at the quarterback, he's got to be one of the best in the league. Um, he's a little bit more orthodox than a guy like Patrick Mahomes, I think. And I think people feel like that makes him a safer pick. That makes the Bills a safer pick. And I'll, I'll be very excited to see that matchup. I, I expect that to be the AFC Championship once again. Mahomes, of course, had five touchdowns yesterday, reminded everyone why he is and has been kind of the future face of the league as everyone starts to get so excited about Josh Allen. Yeah, and you almost wonder. It's um, in some ways, as people hype up the season and start to drill into it, it's almost like there's an effort to... I think if you lived in Kansas City, you might think there's almost an effort to push Mahomes off the front page. Right. To almost say, oh, you know, he was he had his time. This is now about Josh Allen and uh, Herbert. And, and right. This is, this is sort of this next generation of guys. But yeah, Mahomes with what was it? Four or five touchdowns? Five. Last night? five touchdowns. Five. Yeah. He had five. <sighs> um, and in that same game. Murray, 360 yards. Uh, you know, Murray, Murray on the other side looked solid. Kyler Murray, he had a solid showing, but we see once again the difference in the truly elite quarterbacks and that next tier. And <laughs> Kyler Murray oh. getting paid Patrick Mahomes money, I think you know that's still up for debate, and we'll see how that plays out over time. All these guys getting paid just about the same amount of money, right? Where it, and it's almost like the NFL quarterbacks are not bragging about how much they make now; it's how much they're guaranteed. Perhaps mm -hmm. I mean it's strange. It's strange how this has evolved. Okay, now you mentioned the truly elite quarterbacks. To me, the truly elite quarterbacks are a short list. It's 
it's Mahomes, it's Brady, who's never lost to the Dallas Cowboys and never lost to the Atlanta Falcons. I learned that this morning. And Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers. Whew. That looked rough. rough and I gotta ask one. Do you think, I mean, Rodgers is Rodgers' is magic as a quarterback, you know, all the talent in the world. Do you get the sense that there's almost going to be a problem and that he's not a particularly sympathetic figure in the locker room? And as these rookie and young wide receivers struggle, is he putting more pressure on these guys when he needs to, he needs to be almost nurturing these guys? And maybe that's, that's not his deal. I don't think that's his deal. I also don't know if it's fair to expect that of him. He's a professional. He's at a point in his career where he's got to be competing for championships. The front office knows that. And, you know, they go and draft Jordan Love when they could be taking an elite wide receiver a few Mm -hmm. years back. They've, I feel like his frustrations, it would be fair for him to be more frustrated with the front office than the the individual players. But with the players they have, and he's got the front office probably telling him, hey, we've got guys, we're ready to compete, we're doing everything you want. And so he's his expectations of those players is to play at a Devontae Adams level, you know, to play at a Greg Jennings or all the great wide receivers who have played for Green Bay. I do think there is the tendency to overreact with week one. I know there's been years where Tom Brady has a bad week one and people start to say, hey, is it over? Is this the end of the Tom Brady? You know, he threw three interceptions and his team lost by three touchdowns in week one. He didn't look like the same guy. Age is finally catching up to him. And then over the course of the season, there's that regression to the mean. As a fantasy footballer, I tend to try to trade for guys who start off really weak like that because I so often you see a regression to the mean in sports. But nevertheless, with Aaron Rodgers, it, it's still at that point. Reaction, right? I mean, yeah. you know, got guys dumping Rodgers probably this week on the fantasy market. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe he keeps playing at that level. Maybe maybe he was relying on Devontae Adams. But my personal take is, uh, you know, I, I would take the risk. I think it's worth the, I think it's worth the gamble to just yeah. roll the dice on a guy like Aaron Rodgers who has always bounced back. And there's no reason to believe he won't. I mean, last year he... Uh, I mean, last year, remember he came off that off season with essentially almost saying he hated the Packers and was never going to play <laughs> for them again. And and I think they got they got drilled in Week One by about thirty points. Yeah. And and then I think they went you know whatever it was thirteen and four something in that kind of range. Um, okay, you also mentioned you know Tom Brady's name has snuck into the conversation as well. As always. <sighs> Autopilot, man. To me, the more the most interesting thing potentially about the Brady is everyone is on the same wavelength, and the fact that I, I, I don't remember who had the game, but they had got Michael Jordan to do some of the pregame commentary, and, and so this is you know we are witnessing this generation's uh, generation every twenty five years. We're witnessing this year's goat, and the commentary is from last la, you know the last generation's goat, and. I, there's probably multiple documentary crews following this guy around. As there should be. As there should be. And uh, interesting thing about yesterday's game, for those who watched the game, the game really was... The dominant player of the game was Leonard Fournette. <laughs> he he was the Bucks player that... And, and the, the Tampa Bay defense as well. But with quarterbacks, with the NFL, the tendency has always been to con- attribute the win to the quarterback... And it's, hey, Tom Brady's back. Yeah, he missed 10 days of training camp or, or whatever it was. And he comes out and like a well-oiled machine, steamrolls the the Dallas Cowboys, who of course lost Dak Prescott in that game. Speaking of the Dallas Cowboys, if memory serves me correctly, their last few quarterback changes for the long term have come with an injury. I remember Tony Romo taking over due to injury and never giving the job back. And then years later, Tony Romo gets hurt. Dak Prescott comes in, plays at a very high level as a rookie, causes Tony Romo to retire. He wasn't, it didn't look as though he was going to be retiring anytime soon prior to that. Dak Prescott out for a couple weeks. Does history repeat itself? I have no idea. I don't know that they have the guy behind him, but something to keep an eye on a storyline uh, with Dallas always, regardless of how good they are, always kind of being at the forefront in the national landscape in terms of media. You know, Doug, here's a here's a question to you. You know, maybe the most famous injury replacement where a guy never gave up the job was Drew Bledsoe getting hurt and Tom right. Brady coming. But now, quarterbacks make 
forty million dollars a year, <laughs> and the money is guaranteed for the next four years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, does that change that that level of competition? Where uh, you know you don't even can you even put a guy have a guy that's capable of taking over on the roster? Um, you know that 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 kind of backup. Look, I, I think you know Dallas has suddenly Dallas went from being an interesting story to now a classic Dallas story, mm -hmm. right? Because when the Cowboys are struggling and an injured quarterback, and and look, if they if the backup comes in and lights it up, oh my God, you know th there's no better NFL situation than a quarterback from a media perspective than a quarterback controversy in Dallas. Yeah, and I don't necessarily expect that, but I did want to pull from history and look at this and say, hey, you know, Tony Romo, there when he went down, there was no, I don't know if anyone felt like, hey, he's never going to be the starter for the Dallas Cowboys ever again. And with Dak, had this happened two years ago, under different circumstances, be, it would be very different. But the, the contract situation certainly plays a role in decision-making with quarterbacks. And to be frank, I don't know that there are 32 starting caliber quarterbacks in the NFL. And so for one team to have multiple is pretty rare these days. So I, I don't expect that. But again, if history repeats itself, that's what will happen. We'll have to keep an eye on it. Okay, the most wild game of the weekend. Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. <laughs> Joey. Joey had a rough one. But he also had he had a real rough first half. He had kind of an interesting, very productive second half. Uh, he's fun to watch, even when things aren't going great. He's actually kind of a an amazing guy to watch on the sideline. There's like no emotion. He's he's fascinating, right? Because he's a complete stoic professional. Mm -hmm. And then the post game, con you know. Press conference is always just utter magic. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you your two cents on this in a sec. Very minor story, but Mitch Trubisky for the Steelers played just well enough to eke out the victory. I, I'm not particularly interested in Trubisky, but I think that's a fascinating thing for a quarterback to do. And so let's say the Steelers are, does Trubisky play just average enough and absolutely frustrate the Steelers fan base, right? There's nothing worse than a guy that's just a game manager and keep Kenny Pickett on the bench all year. I mean, a local story, not really a national story, but God, I mean, look, you know how this goes. I mean, you've been a fan of teams. I bet you in Pittsburgh, they're going nuts for Pickett right now. <laughs> I'm sure there are fans that would have rather seen them lose. I've been that fan before because you're thinking long term. You're thinking this isn't the guy. You know, we're wasting our time. And Mitch Trubisky, I got to give you credit, Mike, at least for week one. Looking at the QB wins metric, uh, you looked at the numbers and said, I don't see that big of a drop off from last year's Ben Roethlisberger to last year's Mitch Trubisky as far as performance, the optics may be that they're going from a Hall of Famer to a first round but or number one pick bust. But Mitch Trubisky, we've seen it with him, and Carson Wentz is another guy who performed. He actually performed quite well yesterday. People like to give up and kind of overlook these more veteran quarterbacks who once had the hype, who once people thought might be the guy, and they didn't become Tom Brady. And so there's this thought that. Hey, you know, I'd rather have Zach Wilson. I'd rather have Justin Fields, et cetera. Whereas at this point in his career, like a Carson Wentz or a Mitch Trubisky is tends to be more productive than those guys. Um, and so Baker Mayfield, another one who I'm, you know, I'm not real fond of any of these quarterbacks and I'm glad they're not the quarterback of my team. Of course, Daniel Jones is, but, um, but nevertheless, there, there is this kind of those players who tend to be overrated early in their careers tend to become underrated later. Alex Smith was the best example of that. He was viewed as a bust and had a very productive career later as, as an NFL quarterback. Okay. Trey Lance versus Justin Fields. <laughs> you know, the rain didn't help. Um, and I, I, rain, I you, you got to throw this out with the rain, but <laughs> still there was no glory you wanted the. I think what the NFL would have loved to see was two quarterbacks throw for 400 yards and three touchdowns, maybe an interception each, just to keep it interesting. That was not the case. I I think Fields had the less pedestrian day, but the one highlight I keep seeing of Justin Fields wasn't during the game; it was after the game. The yes, I, I'm sure you've seen this, Mike, but 
victory formation snap, and then the whole team runs the end zone, slip and slides their way to to victory, and gets up and flexes on on the downers. That was Justin Fields yesterday, becoming a meme once again, all over social media once again. Always, always the center of attention. Always fascinating to follow Fields and the Bears moving forward. Just like we've been saying all off season. Yeah, and so it's still you know that, that weather. I don't know if the, you can reach any con- one week in yeah. that weather. Can't reach any conclusions. Uh, Trey Lance, you know this is going to turn into an interesting story, right? I mean that was not a that was not a great effort, and you got an L. And I got to think there's a big chunk of San Francisco 49 fans that think if we'd played the other guy, we'd have Get one victory. We'd have a victory. And and so this is in the NFL. Can you really give away victories in the, you know, because you be, just believe in the other guy without any real, without any real evidence. Yeah. And what happens, this happens a couple games. Jimmy G ends up back in the mix, QB1 for the 49ers. I'm not predicting that. I'm simply saying it's a possibility, and it makes a very sticky situation with contracts between Garoppolo and Trey Lance. Uh, I'm going to predict it that Jimmy G will be on that field, uh, that will be QB1 at some point this year. <sighs> uh, and again, he may not end up that way, but I think at some point there, there's a re- very reasonable chance, a high probability that they'll – think that the idea is to take the pressure off of Trey Lance if the heat gets too much. So it's I think the fan criticism at that point is that you're ruining Lance's confidence. You take a guy, you give him the go and then you pull him early and he's forever shaken and they will blame that coach on why Trey Lance doesn't become this elite quarterback whereas the the reality may be that he's just not. <laughs> and 100% self-inflicted as we see this go down. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Okay, Doug, you got any others that notable? I got, I got a lot. Lamar Jackson coming out, uh, tossing three TDs in his first game. After after the game, they asked him about his contract situation, and they said, you know, you were offered this much guaranteed money. He's like, oh, it wasn't guaranteed. He was pulled away by some of the Ravens staff or, or whatever. <laughs> you would consider the people that pull Lamar Jackson away from the podium. Um, so, no Zach Wilson in week one. I mentioned the Commanders, Jags, uh, Trevor Lawrence with a pedestrian, you know, below average week one, kind of picking up where he left off last year. Trayvon Walker, though, showed out for the Jacksonville Jaguars, number one pick this year. He had a forced fumble, an interception, and a sack all in the first week. So I think any doubt about his status as the best player in this year's draft class probably hushed, at least for the time being. Um the Colts Texans ending in a tie, that is just disgusting to American football fans. I pulled a quote from Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso, uh, the words of the great former coach of what was it, the Wichita State Shockers? Was that his college team that he coached? Oh, God, I forget. I think it was yeah. even lower level than that, wasn't it? <laughs> it was something. He, uh, Ted Lasso, the great f- football t- uh, turned football coach, says, if God would have wanted games to end in a tie, she wouldn't have invented numbers. I think that's how all football fans feel about a tie. And, you know, Colts, Texans kissing their sister in week one is uh, nobody satisfied with that. Oh, God. I mean, this is this is how the, the website, the Ted Lasso fandom.com just says he was picked from an obscure college level American <laughs> football team in Kansas. I'm pretty sure so. there was an actual team in the show. Uh, um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> A great Ted Lasso, but uh, okay. Let's see. Well, and, uh, one other one was uh, we haven't touched on Baker Mayfield taking that L. Oh, I guess we did touch on him taking that L to the Browns, but we didn't touch on the Baker Mayfield side of that story. Uh, where I saw the press conference, it's it's standard Baker Mayfield. Yeah, right. I mean he he's got this he's got this approach to the media of it almost reminds me of Ron Zook at Florida. Uh, Everything's fixable, right? There's this swagger and everything's fixable. And, you know, you, you again, uh, that's, a, that's a fun story, for, I think, to you and me. I don't know how much anyone else really cares. I'm just waiting for Sam Darnold to get back in there. It feels inevitable that's going to happen, but I do think Baker Mayfield thinks that he's Aaron Rodgers still. 
Uh, one yeah. last note on the NFL. I think one last note. I have there's so much happening in sports this week, especially in football, that it's hard to. I guess I got two last notes. One is that Justin Herbert outdueled Derek Carr as you predicted, Mike, last week. Justin Herbert, he's creeping into that. We talk about the elite quarterbacks. I don't know that there is a quarterback in the league, given age and all the rest, that I'd rather have on my team than Justin Herbert. He's the guy that I was recommending. If anyone asked me about fantasy football, he was the guy I was saying to go And for. I hated that I, I guess I th- thought people would undervalue him a little more than they did, and I waited a little too long, and I missed out on him this year. But, I mean, I had him in his rookie year, and <laughs> Herbert was my ace in the hole. So um, one other note is that uh, this is just kind of a fun fact. Not a single AFC South win in week one, even though two AFC South teams played each other. Rough start for the AFC South. Yeah, well, sorry, Doug. I uh, I am listening to you, but I'm also surfing the web for the NFL Week Two schedule. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Basically, the AFC South had a rough start. <laughs> okay, and so on to Week Two. Top storylines. I don't have as many as I had last week in in terms of the the storylines and some of the ones that I had identified as I was you know sort of looking at the schedule while watching college football before before the games kicked off um, have actually kind of blown up. I mean, you know, the game I was probably most looking forward to was Dallas versus Cincinnati, a Prescott versus Burrow. Mm. I mean, it's still a compelling story. And again, the beauty of the NFL, but now we've got, you know, Burrow trying to come back from an off game, you know, where where you're 0-1 versus a Dallas team that almost feels like they're in crisis. Dallas almost always feels like they're in crisis, but this time it feels like there's good reason. Typically they're healthy and losing when they should be winning. And there's panic in that stadium that enormous spaceship of a stadium uh but yesterday's crisis we saw this was another this you know was probably an honorable mention for fan of the week i don't know that it represents you being a good fan as much as just crazy people at football stadiums which is why i didn't put them on the list but there was quite the fight amongst dallas cowboys fans in that stadium (laughs) yesterday and i almost i expect that every week that's moving forward i'm expecting that every week particularly you know there tends to be less fights amongst your fan base when your team's winning but that's not always the case. We saw a Georgia Oregon game. There was a heck of a brawl between two Georgia fans uh, in the concourse area. So, guy just about knocked out another guy. And college, college, college sports fans, NFL sports fans, I think football fans, they just have they have that dog in them, as they say. They have that dog in them. But you know what's funny? Whenever I talk about fan passion and get into those kind of things. As long as I have, and again, this is, this is a little bit of an aside, we see this absolute craziness. Doug, I have a feeling nothing that we're going to come up with all season in terms of identifying fans of the week would even make the honorable mention list if we were sitting here in Europe and we were talking about, you know, Tottenham versus Arsenal. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. And somehow that doesn't translate as well into the States um, with football, but we're we're calm. we're actually calmer than we realize in the states. We are, we are, but I I do think there's, on uh, you know, to argue that to counter that, I think there's this like redneck aspect of football. Like you watch App State's fans run and celebrate this week and last week, and I think they're getting college game day now. Um, but my biggest takeaway from college football in the first two weeks is that those fans in Boone are absolutely. Yeah bonkers they are bonkers and i talked about it last week on the podcast and i talked about it this week i would say if we had a rankings for college football fans like it's ap top 25 of fans after two weeks they'd be number one their team's yeah. one and one the fans are two and oh i you know i i don't think there's any uh it's it's almost more of a you know i'm i'm, I'm gonna avoid as, answering that because it's gonna take me into the weeds uh because i think there is something kind of really interesting this question of how do you develop kind of that that real loyalty to an institution you know if you're not ohio state or georgia or usc and i think there there there's definitely some value in looking at them as a as a case study okay the one the couple, one app state fan that i know traveled to college station from georgia watched the game, went to the whole 12th man rally, whatever it is, the whole cult thing they do at A&M, 
and watch their team win, celebrated big. They travel, they travel for App State like they try anytime they play an AP top 10 team, those fans are there. They are there. Yeah. Well, it's their thing, right? And they've got yeah. the they've got the history of it. Okay, Doug, a, a other couple of again, looking ahead to to next week in the NFL, the Miami Baltimore. I love that one. Tua had a big game. Tua did have a big game. But I believe Jackson actually speculated that Miami might be the city he wants to go to if he doesn't sign with Baltimore. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Green Bay versus Chicago. Fields versus Aaron Rodgers. Okay, so I got news for you. Rodgers will find his stride this week. If for no other reason than the Chicago Bears fans feel cursed, cursed by Aaron Rodgers. Exactly. And we remember last year. What was it he said to that? Was there a female fan in the Bears? Yes, he, I own you. I <laughs> own you, yeah. And he does own the Bears. I think Bears fans going into this one are feeling like, you know, it's kind of like if Auburn were playing Alabama this week where it's like Alabama showed some weakness last week and Auburn's 2-0 and and they're, they're feeling themselves. But I feel like that's how Bears fans feel like, hey, Green Bay's vulnerable. We've got momentum. We're coming off a win. New coaching staff. Second year with Fields coming into his own. And this is the time we're going to do it. And like maybe they beat him once. I don't know. But it does seem like it has the stage is set for Aaron Rodgers to silence those excited Bears fans one more time as he does. We'll see what happens. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, but Doug, the game, and this is why I was going to the schedule before. My top game going into next week is actually the Thursday night game. And that's the Chargers versus the Chiefs. Oh, because wow. yeah. I think this is, you know, of these young quarterbacks, Herbert and Allen may be relatively, you know, close in all this. But that's a, that that AFC West division has a lot of talent at the quarterback position, and it's kind of interesting, right? It's like Derek Carr now takes a lot of heat for maybe being the worst quarterback in that division. Herbert's the guy that seems to have the potential to actually challenge Mahomes for being the top guy in that division. So that's going to be you know whoever scheduled that picked a good one for Thursday night. They absolutely did. And like I said before, if I'm starting a team right now and I get my pick of all the quarterbacks, including Mahomes, I'm very tempted to go with Justin Herbert. I love his game. I love, I I mean, there's, there's nothing about that kid that I don't love as far as the way he plays football. And I'm sure he will be exposed at some point in his career. You know, sometimes we have a little bit of a a newness bias with these guys uh, because Mahomes was that way at one point. I think Josh Allen's that guy right now for the, the bulk of NFL fans, but you know, as as Mahomes has gotten a little older and we've seen him throw some more interceptions and stuff, it's like, oh, he's got weakness. I'd rather have someone else. Maybe that will happen with Herbert, but Herbert's fascinating to me. I love him. I think that this will be a great game because you're seeing, you know, we've seen the Tom Brady versus Mahomes passing of the torch games where Tom Brady still had it in that Super Bowl. Um, Mahomes versus, I mean, versus uh, Herbert, you know, it's not so much a passing of the torch. They're kind of in the same generation, it's kind of like a Kobe and LeBron where there's going to be quite a bit of overlap in their careers. And these are two of the quarterbacks that, you know, it could turn into a Peyton Manning, Tom Brady type thing where we're seeing them duke it out in really big games every single year. And this is kind of the first version, the 1.0 of that. And so I don't know. I mean, I don't know if the Chargers are good enough to be in those games like the Chiefs have been, but the quarterback certainly seems to be. And I think the numbers will be great on Thursday night because I think people are starting to pick up that the Justin Herbert is a worthy competitor to Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, I, I don't know about the marketability, right? I mean, you know, Southern California football is always <laughs> is always a challenge, but yeah, but you know, this could be one of these really great things for the uh, great things for the league if yep. Herbert gets to. And look, my my fondness for Herbert is almost entirely based on the numbers, right? I mean, so it's like that's where he really kind of stuck out for me in terms of how he performed statistically so early on in his career. You know, this sets up beautifully, right? The one guy playing in L.A. in that stadium with a lukewarm fan base mm-hmm. versus the other guy that, you know, playing in Kansas City where they set the, the volume records. He's already got a Super Bowl. You know, the, uh, these rivalries are really, 
really important, right? And, and obviously Mahomes, Brady, that's a rivalry that can't last more than what, five, six more years, Doug, right? Um, they, no, you know, but you know, it's like we got, we got, there, there's always this question of next and that, that our, our sort of podcast adage of the NFL always wins. Yeah. The NFL always wins. And what they've got next is Allen, uh, Herbert challenging Mahomes. You know, it's the NFL wins. It wins. And they have, for whatever reason, they've had an easier transition to the kind of post goat, post Tom Brady era than I think the NBA is having with LeBron. Uh, you know, moving it's like they're trying to find their guy, and there's a couple guys, but when there's a couple guys, is there really one guy? You know, is Jason Tatum and Devin Booker enough, or, or Jokic and uh, Doncic? It's it's tough. It's a tough transition. The NFL <clears throat> seems very well positioned to well, transition from Tom Brady. The NFL has, the NFL has thirty leading guys duking it out for that, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, the NFL has that structure where right. it's it's always going to it's always going to work out. Okay, Doug, I'm looking at the clock, so we got to we got to pick up the pace here. Pick up the pace. Week 3 of week 2 of college football has ended. I'll tell you, and again, we got to be we got to be quick here. The pregame for Alabama, I don't know if you you caught this. Yeah. Nick Saban talking about how NIL may harm competitive balance. I thought he was uh I thought he was channeling the podcast but wow that's kind of amusing and got to be frustrating to the other coaches out there who all think NIL is now their means of actually getting some competitive balance back into college football and not having it be all about Alabama. Yeah, first off I'd like to thank Nick uh for listening to the podcast. Nick, we appreciate your listenership and are happen to consult on any of your um, decision making, whether it's how to lose to Georgia next or how to handle NIL, that's what we're here for. Um, Mike, you'll call you up something <laughs> to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on a on a serious note, Nick Saban's been saying for years, transfer portal NIL. He's been saying this isn't good for football. This isn't good for competitive balance. He's the beneficiary of this. His team. I mean, you look at. Alabama, their entire receiving core just about is transfers. Mm -hmm. They're, I mean, last year, their best player, Jameson Williams, uh, arguably their best player, their best receiver, um, best playmaker was from the transfer portal. NIL is helping them. You know, they have such an advantage over other schools in that department. And the fact that he's willing to come out and say, like, I mean, he's, I've heard him say, it, you know, in different words, but essentially, hey, look, this isn't fair. Teams like right. Alabama are going to benefit. Don't get mad at me when I'm I'm playing by the rules, but I don't really think right. these are smart rules. I don't like Bryce everyone. Young on, on the Dr Pepper commercials. That seems that seems too much, like violating the the the, the Bryce Young on the Dr Pepper commercials, the Fansville commercials, makes me think. Yeah, this is truly going to be unfair. Right? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's too. You know, it's too much for the the you know the big dogs to get all the prizes in addition to you know being the big dog. Yeah, my favorite thing at NIL isn't those Dr. Pepper commercials where last year was DJ Uyungle, this year it's Bryce Young. I like the real small local businesses that work with yeah. these local players. We've seen Kool-Aid McKinstry. Um, that's not as much of a local one, but I, I think the coldest, the coldest is it, is it the coldest McKinstry? The coldest, there's some there's a player on Alabama named the coldest, and he does uh he does an NIL deal with an air conditioning company in the state of Alabama, and he advertises on television saying that he's going to make your house the coldest. And so <laughs> I see that kind of stuff is just great. I love it. Stetson Bennett doing a, you know, he's delivering mail at an apartment complex, showing off the amenities of a local Atlanta apartment. I think that gets the locals to yeah. tune in. And I think it's all fun and games. But uh, we ever talk about Luke Ford's NIL deal. You may not even be aware of this. No, I don't know that I am aware. Luke Ford signed a, a, an NIL deal with the WWE. Is he going to fight? I, <laughs> I don't know. But you know what? You know what? Let's let's put a pin in that one to come back to that one because that was one of the that was one of the stories over the summer that I think we we sort of missed out on as we were talking more of the NFL preview. But uh, you know, he's he's been such a he's. A, Luke Ford is a guy we've talked a lot about on the, pro on the podcast because of his transfer battles. Um, but, you know, the fact that he keeps, you know, hasn't really panned out as a player, 
but really had a strange impact in, in college football and even a strange, you know, NIL kind of deal. Okay, Doug. So again, I'm, I'm just looking at the clock here. So let's yep. speed up here. Notre Dame loses to Marshall. Marcus Freeman, 0-3 as the Notre Dame coach. The pressure's on. <sighs> Is it? I mean, um, p- pressure's on. Scott Frost is no longer the Nebraska coach. How quick is that? You know, Notre Dame's not going to make that kind of move anytime, anytime soon, but that's a struggling brand and a really bad season. You know, look, I mean, Nebraska might be a great parallel. Nebraska has fallen from the ranks of the elite brands in college football to being an also ran Big Ten team. I don't think there's any, and you tell me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's any luster or legacy associated with the Nebraska brand. I think that's a total rebuild job. If you're Notre Dame, you know, how much time do you give Freeman? I don't know how much time. We're going to see what he does the rest of the season, but clearly. Could not have started on a worse note his career. I, you could see it in his body language. And I seriously doubt that the fan base has any faith that he's going to be the guy in the long term. It's just a matter of do we fire him this year? Do we fire him next year? Do we fire him the year after that? I think there's probably a lot of fans that are like, hey, let's just cut our losses and move on. Uh, it's a lot more complicated to do that. You know, It's easier said than done because of contract situations in college sports. So I think Notre Dame's a school that they ought to be benefiting from NIL. They ought to be one of those schools where Nick Saban saying, hey, there's not going to be a lot of parody. The Notre Dames of the world with their television deal, with their kind of the films that have been made and the how wide of an audience they have as far as there's Notre Dame fans in every state in the country. You know, I, I feel like that's got to be their move. Let's uh, almost argue about this. You know, okay. I, I would have thought the exact same thing. I'm not convinced that that's real anymore. I, I mean, you know, I, I know that's always been the thing that the, oh, Notre Dame is the college football brand. Maybe that's just living in the past. I mean, to to recruits, are they the the? I don't know. I don't know if it's actually real. The I, it, it's almost like it's a legacy of like this used to be something, but I don't know whether it's real to anyone. I don't know that anyone is motivated by that Notre Dame brand. I just feel like I feel like they can fake it till they make it at this point um, <laughs> because it, it is a sleeping giant in a sense where you do have, I, I know a handful of Notre Dame fans and I've never lived anywhere remotely near Notre Dame in my what, life. Okay, so let's dig into that real quick. Why are they Notre Dame fans? Because their dad was, because they grew up watching them. Um, are they Catholic? I mean, is that the, is that the no, connection? Uh, my, the guys I know, yeah. yeah um, I, I think it's mostly grew up watching them. That was a team when I was four years old, I went up to the game, you know, so I'll touch down Jesus and, pulled for them they won a championship and have always you know been a fighting irish yeah i didn't go there i went to this different school but i that's my team that's who i pull for and those people i feel like you know if they if they could have if there was a bryce young if there was a caleb williams if there was a face to that team it would be very very valuable because there are so many people who say hey that's my team i there just isn't a whole lot to get excited about and I think it could turn around very quickly. So that's where I feel like, you know, if I'm if I'm a Notre Dame, I'm thinking, all right, we got to we got to figure out whatever Texas A and M's been doing with NIL, um, some of these other schools that have really benefited from it. Of course, it's up, you know, it's questionable as to how much Texas A and M's benefited after losing to App State in Week Two of college football. Uh, Jimbo Fisher off to a rough start as well. I mean, I, look, I, Doug, I agree with you on Notre Dame in, in principle. I just. I, I just can't figure out if this is just something that we we believe this because we've heard it so long. They need a Nick but, Saban. I think at the end of the day, they. I remember when Alabama hired Nick Saban. Alabama had been, they were yeah. bad. They were bad. They were bad. My whole, I mean, because I grew up in Alabama and I was a Georgia fan, family all pulled for Georgia. And it was like, oh, poor Alabama. We're playing them again. I hope Brody Cruel doesn't get hurt because he, he's a family friend. But, um, but it just feeling like, you know, these poor guys, they're never going to have anything and they used to be great. Mm-hmm. And so they're just miserable because they have this expectation that they're never going to live up to. And Nick Saban comes to town and they weren't good that first year. That first year was just a repeat of everything else. But nevertheless, there was this excitement. You know, the spring game was packed out. The things changed with that coach, bringing in that coach. I think Notre Dame probably has the resources to pull that kind of move. Problem is, Nick Saban is a generational coach. We use the term generational way too often, but he truly is. And there's not, it's not like there's going to be a Nick Saban waiting in the wings every time you have a coach fired and they've got to pick I almost, probably. 
Go ahead. I almost wonder if, you know, Notre Dame, you know, Notre Dame has always held themselves out there as special. <laughs> I almost wonder if Notre Dame needs to actually, you know, join up with other, like, so Notre Dame sort of putting themselves out there as we're, we're this unique, we're this unique school, you know, we're, we're above the big 10. Mm-hmm. Notre Dame might be better suited to actually joining the Big Ten or the SEC and having a, you know, having a rival playing Ohio State and Michigan every year, right? Getting into that kind of that system where the high school kids, you you mentioned Bryce Young, where those kids want to go to Notre Dame. I mean, you know, I, I think you're right that it's not like Nebraska where the brand has faded. But I don't know that that brand is anywhere near as, I guess, I think that I suspect there's a mismatch between how powerful Notre Dame thinks their football brand is versus how powerful it actually is when you're talking about assembling a class of, when you're talking about bringing 17 and 18 year olds to a place like South Bend, right? It's That's fair. I just look back a year and I say, you look at Lincoln Riley going to USC, another sleeping giant. And I know it hasn't been as long for USC. Uh, their drought hasn't been as long. But they bring in that coach. He brings over a bunch of transfers. They get one of the top recruiting classes. This year, looks like they're going to be a top 10 team. We'll see how that pans out. But for the foreseeable future, they went from zero to hero with one coaching change. In this day and age with the transfer portal, it's very easy to get you know, once you get a little momentum for things to really escalate, to really snowball. And Notre Dame, if they make a coaching change, I think part of the decision-making nowadays has got to be what players can we get in addition to the coach? Because Lincoln Riley is a perfect example. USC didn't just get a coach. They got an experienced quarterback, a a legitimate Heisman candidate. You know what the really the tough situation would be, Doug? What's that? You know who's the guy that could probably turn Notre Dame around? Uh, Nick Saban. (laughs) Urban Meyer. Yeah. That, I'd but love they to see. can't do it, right? <laughs> they can't do it. And I, I don't know that he would do it. He might have some heart issues over in uh, South Bend. But, yeah, Notre Dame's in an interesting situation. I think Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M is pretty interesting. They've recruited like crazy. Uh, all their success has been off the field, on the field. Last year, they beat Alabama. They also went 8-4. and four. This year, off to a 1-1 one one start. Quarterback play hasn't been great. And fan base is beyond frustrated. Uh, but, you know, those are two big upsets this week. So we'll see how things okay. play out over the long term. Looking ahead for this next week in college football, um, just off the sort of perusing the schedule, Oklahoma, Nebraska, kind of a classic game from the 1980s. Um, Nebraska desperately needs Oklahoma as an out of conference rival, but program in disarray. Yeah, program in disarray. I don't see that necessarily being close, um, no. especially given the circumstances in Nebraska. So, so I, I don't know that. I, I would be more excited for like, like I see Penn State versus Auburn. Penn State's ranked number twenty-two. Auburn's not ranked, but they're one of those teams where it's like maybe they're like a twenty-five, twenty to twenty-five type team. They're two and zero, and that game's going. That's going down in the plains. Jordan Hare in Auburn. Uh, that's the type of game I'm excited for more. So I'm looking at the rest of the schedule to well, see give you a couple Miami and a and Miami and 13, Miami, Miami and 24, A&M. Texas A&M. That, ooh, Jimbo, if he loses that one. You know, and, and that's fun. And if you think about it in terms of conference realignment, right? It's, it's almost like Miami auditioning for a place in the SEC. You know, yeah. that's, uh, I think that's a fun way to look at it. How about BYU yep. or maybe auditioning for a place in the Big Ten? Maybe so. We'll see what happens. And of course, Oregon had a rough start to their season. Uh, BYU lost, uh, excuse me, they won a a thriller against Baylor this week, but kicking was absolutely atrocious. It was one of the ugliest college football games. And as a college football fan, when it's not my team playing, I almost enjoy those. I almost enjoy a game where it's just really bad, ugly football and like, oh, who's going to fumble next? How are they going to turn the ball over? Two teams trying to lose the game. That that's so exciting and fun to watch. I know a lot of guys that enjoy that. A lot of people that enjoy that. Um, BYU though, they're kind of a interesting football program. Like they've had Zach Wilson. They've had they've been top twenty five teams more often than not these last couple of years. They're of uh, course, uh, of course, they're not perceived as elite. Of course, you know, but about their legacy, Jim yeah. McMahon, Steve, um, Steve Young, right? I mean, yeah. Zach Wilson. It's um, 
they've got a better quarterback legacy than you know half the NFL teams, right? Half was, the SEC teams. Yeah, I mean, and and, and, and I, look, I don't know how they. BYU is kind of a fascinating one that probably none of the major conferences are really thinking a lot about. But I got news for you. It's kind of a strange national fan base as well, isn't it? I mean, so it's it might be an interesting one to to put into the mix as we get into conference realignment. Um, it's it's a different kind of program, obviously, but you know, they got a tradition. They got a tradition. They've got some passion. If you watch that game, they're I mean, they had a, a great electric atmosphere against Baylor. Baylor's another team in that same category when you look at conference realignment. Not the traditional SEC team. You know, I don't know who they fit in with, but they want they won the Big 12 last year. They've had you know RG3 play there. They've had some great teams. They've had some great coaches go on to the NFL. Um, they've had some terrible teams as well. And so it's hard, you know, you could see them being a Vanderbilt in the SEC, but you could also see them being maybe not a Texas A&M, but being competitive uh, kind of at the next level in a, in a different conference. And yet you don't hear their name thrown around quite a bit. So um, I have one last thought in regards to college football, and it's just that it's been so unpredictable. Last week, I I thought Texas was going to get smacked. I feel like in retrospect, looking at all my picks for college football this year, it's just been, you know, I thought Oregon, Georgia was going to be close. I was going to, I love the unpredictability of it. I think that's what makes college football so much fun. And I, I, I'm enjoying this March madness of a season. It feels like college football is drunk and it just keeps taking shots. And so I'm looking forward to this next upcoming week. And I'm always kind of trying to tune in and find which games are going to be the most interesting because it has not let me down in the first two weeks of the season. Yeah, you know, Doug, in, in a weird way, and then we'll switch over. I've thrown another one of these charts from the from our fandom survey, the Next Generation 2022 survey up there. You know, Doug, in a weird way, you know, another observation about college football fandom. College football is a really compelling project product. I almost wonder if they tend to lose out a little bit by playing when they do and like, there's no other option, but by playing the day before the NFL, Mm. you know, we transition so quickly from what happens in the college games to what's going to happen in the NFL. And then by the time Monday hits, right, then the NFL has 80% of the oxygen in the sports universe. Um, which, you know, and again, it's college football is a unique sport. It's like you, you referenced it, right? It's that that campus passion, mm-hmm. right? The dog nation versus the the tide. Na- what do they call them? The Crimson Tide Nation? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think they're you, just the Crimson Tide, but. Yeah, yeah you know, it, that's what's unique about them versus the, you know, marketing behemoth that is the. The NFL. Okay, so Doug, to wrap up real quick, I said we we're going to share. Uh, we're going to share some of the results from this fandom survey as we are moving towards the political season, uh, the official political season. Right, we end up inadvertently talking a lot about politics and sports. One of the questions on this year's survey was, well, the the, the key question is, how much of a sports fan are you? One of the classifications or the segmentation questions for this year was a look at political affiliation where we asked folks to identify themselves as uh, how liberal to conservative you are on a one to seven scale. And the figure I'm showing you, I, look, I don't even think this one's going to be a surprise, but I think it's interesting that, again, we've got the percentage of people that are sports fans and versus sports apathetics, so highly interested in sports versus not at all interested. Um for liberals, it's even 34% sports fans, 33% sports apathetics. As we move to the moderates, we've got 36% sports fans. The apathy rate drops to 21%. And then as we get to conservatives, that's where this chart pops, isn't it? Where yeah. 48% of political conservatives are sports fans, 19% are sports apathetics. You got a reaction to this one? I do. My first, my initial reaction is that the ratios don't necessarily surprise me. Liberal almost being one to one between fans and apathetics. And of course, more than a two to one uh, for conservatives. But across the board, I would expect the percentages to be higher for sports fans. So, I, I mean, this kind of goes back to the, the broader study, which is just that sports are not as mainstream as they've been in the past and they're not as well accepted across the board um moderates 
being between liberals and conservatives, of course, is no surprise. But conservatives, I, you know, I'd love to see it across sports. I'd love to see if there is a sport that appeals more to liberals than conservatives. Maybe the NBA, uh, maybe soccer. I don't know. You know, women's sports, perhaps. I would love to see those numbers across. But uh, you know, to me, this is kind of what hey, I would we think. Can, we can put the, we'll put that chart up on the website at some point. You're right; okay. it does vary a little bit by sports. Yeah. Um, and. You can almost guess that baseball and hockey do better with conservatives, whereas the WNBA and the Olympics do better with with liberals. Um, yeah. but, but even if you look at the NBA, the most progressive of leagues, uh, the fan the the rate of fandom is still higher as you go to more conservative uh, ideology amongst the the consumers. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating, especially considering how much. Amongst conservatives, there's this perception that the NFL and the NBA have been catering to liberals with the Black Lives Matter movements, with the, you know, the endorsements of kneeling for the national anthem or, or whatnot. And so it's as though these leagues are torn between, and I don't know that it's all marketing, you know, it's probably a lot of it is the values of the people that that run the leagues, but do we isolate, you know, do we alienate one group of fans to chase the other and make them become fans? And do we lose those fans in the process? Or do we just go all in and target the guys who are really, or the guys and girls who are really interested in our product and already invested? Uh, from a marketing perspective, it's quite interesting to me, Mike. Yeah. I, I mean, the other thing to add to that though, and I think where it gets really complicated for the leagues and, and we'll, y- you 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 reference something that we've got other data on, which is actually there, there's another question on this survey that actually asks how much does each fan appreciate having people like you as a fan? Hmm. We'll get to that one a little bit later, but that's absolutely fascinating because you're right. Conservatives do feel undervalued by basically every major uh, professional league. Um, the only thing I would add to what you said, I think it, it was well said. You know, if you if you take a step back, I think these kind of charts are they're intuitively they make sense but maybe we don't think why they make sense conservatives tend to be more into traditional values traditional activities associating with groups being parts of things and so you know sports fandom is something that better aligns with i'm not going to say conservative values but maybe with conservative personality traits Mm -hmm. i think the challenge that the leagues have very often is that sometimes their players tend to be much more on the liberal progressive side than their fans do. And so that's the dis- that's the disconnect that these leagues are all struggling with, where it's not just, uh, it's interesting, it's not just, well, how do we market to what our fans want? It's how do we create, you know, how do we, how do we navigate this incredibly polarized and politicized world to keep both our fans and our content producers happy. And I don't think anyone's really comfortable with how that's going at the moment. Yeah. And I know at least at the college level, I know that there are college football players who have voiced disdain for fans or maybe just discomfort. That's probably a more generous way of putting it with fans who believe different things and who are against the things that they're standing for. You know, they're kind of shut up and dribble fans. Uh, when these players are saying like, you only value me as a means of scoring touchdowns as, you know, you're not valuing me as a human. You're not looking at my views. You're not supporting the things that I stand for. And so there's kind of this push pull between fans and players where the fans love the players, players might not love the fans and the fans might not love the players don't love the fans. <laughs> and so I've seen that. I've seen that like at a smaller level. It'll be interesting to see if that escalates in the coming years. Um, you know, 2020, of course, you could feel it more than ever with yeah. COVID, with Black Lives Matter. That's kind of settled down a little bit. But the more vocal players are about their views, and of course, with the kind of a natural difference in views between players and fans, there's a lot of fans that say, hey, I can't root for this guy. I just can't. You know, I, I and yeah. players might feel like I can't I can't play for this team. I can't play for this group of fans who don't value the players values. And as this, you know, and as values, and as it becomes a situation, right, it's no longer this Michael Jordan, you know, this this overused quote of even Republicans buy sneakers. When that becomes unacceptable for how an athlete wants to approach his, for how an athlete wants to use his platform, right, mm-hmm. or her platform, then, you know, the way you described it, I think, is kind of perfect. The fans love the players. The players may not love the fans. 
and the players are upset by somehow the re- way the relationship is working. It, it's got, this is actually, I love the way you kind of went through that because that is the dilemma for the sports businesses going forward. No one wants to put it out there explicitly, but I think that's, I mean, in addition to the technology and Gen Z growing up in households where there wasn't the centralized TV, mm-hmm. you, you put your finger on a, on a big issue. Okay, folks, we are out of time as always. And, and the good news, Doug, is because we went a little bit long, maybe this was your intention, we do not have time for my thoughts on the economics of stardom and the royal family, which probably is a a blessing for all concerned. As always, more content at www.fandomanalytics. Talk next week. Bye.